Good evening, Xavier basketball fans. It's good to be a musketeer. It's March the 4th. We are into March, and the musketeers have found some life. Musketeers now stand 16-13 and 13 on a five-game winning streak, 8-8 eight and eight, even in the Big East, tied for third place. I'll bring in my good friend and also partner in crime for Xavier Basketball, Bill Gabriel. Did you think we'd be here at this point, Bill, three weeks ago? Wow. Uh, did not. Um, you know, I was kind of uh, feeling my uh, down in the dump and blue and thought, man, you know, this, this, is, uh, this isn't the Xavier we're used to, but it's, you know, all the factors that led into it, you know, with the, the new roles, the new coach, um, the, imp- you know, improved bottom part of the Big East as well as the top, you know, just making it so much more competitive top to bottom. And what a turnaround. It's been uh, it's been great to watch. Yeah, just a uh, tough winter. And, you know, weeks ago we were talking about didn't look like that 37-year streak of at least 500 in a league was going to continue. Very, We couldn't see 22 years straight, I believe, or 23 of winning records. Looked like both those streaks are going to come to an end. And we're not there yet, but, boy, we're a lot closer than we were three weeks ago, and uh, things are looking good for the Muskies. Well, we only had one game – for, since our last broadcast, and that was Thursday night. And I, I, I tell you, Bill, I was a little bit worried about this game. You know, the St. John's Red Storm, the Johnnies, have been playing a lot better. They're very athletic. They can get up and down the court. They can shoot. They got Shamori Pons that can go off for 30 points. Uh, middle of the week trip to New York in what I would call a rabid environment. If you watch the game, the crowd was just crazy on top of them. Musketeers come out, 84-73. What was the key to the win there at uh, St. John's? Well, I, I tell you, the uh, the defense they played on Shamari Ponds, um, that game was probably limiting him. Not You know, they didn't. They they didn't shut him out. They didn't keep him from scoring. But man, they really limited him. They made it really difficult on him to find space. And um, you know, the, I think he only had one basket in the first half, and he got that basket right at the end of the half. Um, you know, with a minute or so to go in the half. Um, that is just they they set themselves up. And they got a nice lead in the first half, um, you know, by just the, the solid defense they played. Um, and then just carried it right over with their their defensive play and everything into the second half. And then, wow, what what a, a game by Najee Marshall. Um, just the confidence he is playing with right now. Um, still not making the greatest decision sometimes with the basketball, but, man, if his decision is to shoot, it's looking a lot like a lot better decision than um, maybe forcing a pass somewhere. Um, you know, it was just – that was just an, an impressive performance, and, and the way he did it, it wasn't all one-on-one. He was getting um, passes from the, the, the bigs um, down low when they were getting position. I, there was one, and I was watching replays again today, and there was one particular that stood out in my mind. Um, Tyreek Jones had the ball on the uh, left side of the paint, whirled and kind of saw a double team come in and fired it out and realized he had thrown it to – um, Najee on the on the wing for a baseline jumper, and he uh, had his hands up in the three point um, position as soon as Najee caught it. The ball wasn't even shot yet, not, and Tyreek was already celebrating it going in. And I thought, man, that is just—he didn't even go for the offensive rebound. He just fired the pass, saw Najee rise in the shoot, and he had his hands up already. Um, I thought that was a, a pretty uh, – that confidence is spewing over to everybody, and that's awesome. Well, it makes you wonder, you know, we were questioning how much 
<clears throat> he was shooting from three-point range, not very effectively, well under 30%. Uh, in the low 20%, I think. In fact, still with these last this five-game run where he's been on fire, I think shooting a high 30% from uh, three point, he still isn't over 30% for the year. But it makes you wonder: was this what Coach Steele saw in practice and was just waiting for it to happen in a game and just had to have confidence in in him and let him to continue to take the shots if he was open? Uh, I mean, I. It must be. I mean, it just must have been, you know, they were seeing it in practice, and that's why he kept shooting because they were saying, hey, you're hitting them in practice. They're going to go down in games. And, you know, they've kind of uh, alluded that a, a lot of – not it wasn't just Najee, that a lot of the Xavier players are doing things in practice that they're they're having a hard time with in games. Um, and that just must have, you know, just pop. you know, that just – finally the dam broke, you know, the, the dike broke and, and – he just let loose a flurry there. It was, it was great to watch. And, you know, the key is that we've talked about is the defense. Um, and, again, you go back to preseason, Coach Steele said, this is going to be the best defensive team you've ever seen at Xavier. And there were times when people were just laughing, like, this is the best because they were not playing very, very well. But not only are they playing great defense, they're playing great defense without fouling. And, again, if you look at another factor, they're just – in that game, they shot 33 free throws. And I believe St. John's had under 10. Um, that was the difference in the game. Uh, St. John's made more uh, field goals than the uh, Musketeers, but they just uh, beat them at the free throw line by getting there more often and making a lot more than they did. Uh, and it seems this happened the last – they're not getting fouls, and actually it became very frustrating – to Chris Mullins and Shamori Pons that they just felt like there were times when fouls should be called, but you watch the uh, replay a lot of times that, you know, the refs got it right. They're, they're, they're playing great defense without fouling. And that, that I think is a key. Oh yeah. Then I'm thinking of the play where they both got the technical and I, they, I mean, I never saw a, the flip side angle. Usually they show that and you can maybe see something from maybe their side. But it looked like the, the, the player that they thought fouled had already stepped away from him as he started his drive and, and, and didn't really even hit him in the body or anything when he went for the shot. I, don't, I wonder how much so Shamari's wrist was bothering him, though, in that game after he took that tumble um, in the first half going for that loose ball. Uh, I don't know how much that impacted him as the game went on. Well, uh, I, that's he, a good point. I, I, I watched him yesterday. They actually lost to DePaul. And yesterday he had that uh, wrist wrapped heavily. And, again, he got going after a while, but he struggled early on. I, I got to think, and if you remember that uh, time, if you remember the replay of when he fell, it looked like he fell hard on that uh, wrist. And I got to think it's either heavily bruised or strained or something. Again, he had a big, uh, almost like an ace bandage wrapped around it uh, on uh, – on uh, yesterday, Sunday, when they were playing up at DePaul. And it's not a shooting hand, but, again, it, it, I think it has to be affecting him somewhat. A um, couple of things that still bother me, they're still turning the ball over way too much. And, again, uh, free throw percentage, this right here, I, I heard this during the game, and it is true, uh, Xavier's the worst free throw t- shooting team in the Big East. So those are two huge problems. If you had to pick, which one would you want the Musketeers to work on fixing the most? Free throws or turnovers? Can't have um, both. Can't have, probably can't have both. Um, man, I look back a few games at this just to kind of, um, you know, just to see where they were at individual game-wise. And I'll tell you, they have two games in their current in their last 10, where they had 10 or fewer turnovers. That was the um, the uh, Villanova game, and oh, it, was the, it was the, I think it might have been their first Providence game, or second, because um, they had 18 well, they against them the second. other time. <laughs> yeah, so I think they had the 10 against the, them the uh, – the second time, and then they had, of course, 18 
um, against them. But then every other game has been 14 or more turnovers. So I'm like, well, you know, they're turning the ball over, but they're scoring the basketball. But, man, they just can't keep giving good teams that many more offensive opportunities. And I got to look at their their free throws, and they had a nice little streak going of hitting like 70 to 75% of their free throws. And then they had four straight games where they shot 500 by 50% or so from the free throw line. And that killed their overall percentage in the Big East. And, and as I was looking at cause it, but they weren't, you know, they weren't high for free throw games. They, were really hitting the line. Yeah. they only had like eight attempts, 10 attempts, and there wasn't a whole lot of attempts either. So, um, but then they had a whole bunch of attempts against St. John's, and they shot 70, was it 70? Almost 76%. Percent. Yeah, or 75 point something percent. Yeah, I knew. Um, and so if they shoot like that the rest of the year, I want to say fix the turnovers because <laughs> it looks like they got the free throws squared away. Um, and, and just get the turnovers to that, that manageable 10 um, area. Yeah, I think you're right. And, uh, and, they, and again, yeah, when they seem to shoot a lot of free throws, they shoot a much higher percentage. I think you're right. There were a few games there where they weren't, weren't being aggressive and uh, weren't getting fouled, and uh, so they weren't shooting a lot of free throws. So, you know, if you only shoot eight free throws and you miss four, you need 50%. So you're probably right there. Well, here's the big question as we look at the big picture. Uh, if X wins out without winning the tournament, say they win uh, the next two, first two in the tournament, uh, do they get an at-large bid? I think um, if they win their two remaining games and they win – a single game in the Big East tournament they're in. I think if they get to 20 wins, mm-hmm. or they, they get to uh, 19, they might be in. Um, because they're they're going to have that win over Butler, who everybody keeps throwing out there, because they got the win over Florida, I think, is still yeah. their, their linchpin, um, mm-hmm. even though they ended up turning around and getting spanked by them horribly later. Um, that's their, their linchpin victory that is keeping their what is that net score net in score, their, yeah. yeah it's in the 50s i'm mm-hmm. like and you start looking i'm like man they're not very good in the big east um you know they're they got six, six wins i think yeah six and, um, right now. and so um they just don't have any bad losses really um either and xavier's got those the mm-hmm. couple bad losses in there um, that hurt them, but I think if they win, you know, they get they they, they get into tournament at eighteen and thirteen. They win one. There's a there's a pretty slim chance in the tournament they get in. If they win two in the tournament, they're definitely in. They don't have to win the whole thing. I think they get in for sure at twenty wins. Um, so twenty wins. What type of seed are they looking at? And if they would happen to run the table win the two regular season games and three in the tournament and win the tournament, what type of seed are we looking at? Oh, say, uh, I would say if they don't win the Big East tournament, they win four more games, um, they're probably a 12, and they may be in one of those play-in games um, because I think they have four 12s in those, if I'm not mistaken. Actually, it's 11. 12s and 11, yeah. Um, they couldn't end up with one of those. Um, or if they win the whole thing out, they might creep it up to an 11. I can't see them getting a 10 unless a lot of other people have a bad end of the year, uh, you know, with their remaining games that are in those ballpark areas for those seeds. Um, and they'll say flat out lose every game they got left the rest of the year and, and really drop off the face of the earth. Um, that's about the only way. But there's not a whole lot of people picking next to pull that off. I did see uh, one one um, site had them in as an 11 seed. It was one person. Uh, most people are, have them as the first. and They've at least risen up into the four, first four out group. Um, With Joe Lenardi, yeah, that, that happened today. Yeah. That's a good sign. Yep. 
there's a heartbeat. Well, some people suggest that they might get a single-digit seed if they win the Big East tournament, although the fear a lot of people have is uh, that 8-9 seed. 8-9 uh, game, of course, you win that and you turn around, you got to play a number one seed. Of course, uh, Musketeers know all about that as they were number one seed last year and ended up losing that second round game to, I'm not sure if Florida State was a eight or nine. Usually those are pretty good games. Um, so a lot of people are saying, hey, either give us a, you know, a 10 or a 12 or, or a six or a seven, but keep us out of the eight and nine. And also, I think a good point made, it seems like, especially in past history, the higher the seed the Musketeers have, the farther they go in the tournament, the better they do. It's almost like they play the underdog role better when it comes to March. It's a, it's probably an, an easier role to play because you're, you're not trying to, you're not trying not, you're, you're playing, you're not playing not to lose the game. You're playing just to win it. Um, so that uh, pulls a lot of that pressure off of you. I think when you're a high seed, sometimes you get caught up in playing not to lose, and that makes it a little harder to win. That makes sense. It makes sense. It does. Well, let's look at the Big East. What a crazy, crazy year it's been. Um, in fact, you know, is it the the Musketeers could finish – in sole place, third position, get the third seed for the tournament. The Musketeers could still finish in last in this league because uh, the last place teams, Butler, DePaul, and Providence, are all six and ten. And if they, and I don't know if they play each other, I, I should have that here, but uh, if the Musketeers would lose their last two, they would be eight and ten, and all three of those have a chance of being eight and ten also. So this is a big week for the Musketeers. You know, and uh, just a week or so ago, we were talking about trying to stay in the top six. Now we're looking at uh, maybe a three seed, and um, they're tied right now with Georgetown. Georgetown has two road games coming up, one at DePaul, who just beat St. John's, and then at Marquette, who's uh, trying to uh, stay on top. They need to win out to get at least a tie if Nova wins their last game. Nova has to go to Seton Hall. X, of course, goes to Butler and then hosts the Johnnies next Saturday evening. And Marquette, of course, uh, they're at at Seton Hall. And then they host the Georgetown Hoyas. Um, how do you see this all shaking out? <laughs> oh, that's a good Look question. Look at your magic ball. Um, yeah, my magic ball. Um, you know, I... It, it, everybody is is battling and playing. I mean, you know, just playing great basketball. I mean, you you watch what uh, Struess did, and you know, you're like, wow, man, he's showing he is playing. As it, you know, I, how much more how many more basketball games has he got left to play? You know, um, so he's 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 going to play as hard as he can for every one of them he's got left. Um, the uh, yeah, you know, obviously Nova and Marquette, they're, they're definitely going to be one and two, just a matter of who's there, or they could be 1A, 1B. Um, and then, uh, you know, I like I like X's odds of holding on in that three spot. Um, you know, Georgetown doesn't have an easy end. Uh, Xavier's is probably, based on the teams, they're playing a little easier. Um, and, of course, taking on Butler at Hinkle is not going to be an easy uh, – Easy place to pull that off, but I think they can do it. They've done it in the past. Um, I think St. John's is, uh, uh, you know, reeling a little bit. Um, they're probably going to come into the Centaur Center fired up and try to hold on to whatever place they can, they can salvage. You know, and it's just, shoot, it's, it's awesome. It's great, great conference to watch basketball in. And, and hopefully, you know, I, I, don't, I don't, you know, the standings are going to slide a little bit, but I think you're, you're just going to have chunks of people who all end up with the same record. And and it's going to come down to whatever they use for tiebreakers for the uh, Big East tournament season. Well, it's interesting that you should say that because that's the next thing in my notes. And obviously you don't know because <laughs> you just said, but it is really – there's an interesting thing the Big East 
has done, and they've done it ever since the realignment. First of all, two teams are tied, which is a good chance Nova and Marquette will be. Uh, uh, the the first tiebreaker is obviously head-to-head, and, of course, they beat each other once, so it would go to the next tiebreaker. The next tiebreaker is very interesting, and it actually may include Xavier. If Xavier would win out, making them 10-8, and eight, and Georgetown would lose, and they would have to lose, obviously, to Marquette for the tie to take place, then the rules say you, the two teams tied go to the next team below them, which would be Xavier in third place, and look at their record versus that team. Marquette swept the Musketeers. Nova split with the Musketeers. So based on that, Xavier will help Marquette get the number one seat. Sounds fair. That really wild? <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. And then that is. If you go to the, if you have to go to the next one, which again, if it works out the way we talk about. Uh, They won't have to, given the record against Xavier. But then it goes to the next one is each team's road record against all the Big East teams and see if that's different. So, you know, as I happen to find these online, look them up because I was wondering how they're going to decide. And I started reading this, and I thought, this is crazy. And I'd actually heard one of the – broadcasters on one of the uh, Big East games recently, I don't know which one it was, I've been watching a lot lately, um, talking about you got to figure out the team below you. And I'm like, what is he talking about? So I went and looked it up, and that's what he was talking about. So it's going to be a fun, fun week. Yeah, and uh, like I guess you saw a, a little bit of the DePaul-St. John's game yesterday also. Uh, I watched the highlights today. I was, I was enamored uh, watching I was actually – watching it live and talking about Max Struess, just a guy putting a team on his back saying, we're going to win this game. He was knocking down shot after shot after shot with hand in his face, although we've seen him do that at the Centos before. I remember last year he went off a little bit. We didn't know who he was. Uh, He had actually transferred from, a, I believe, a D2 school to DePaul, but when he got going, um, he uh, he was on fire, and actually it was their senior day. He ended up scoring 43 points, I think, uh, which was a personal record for him. And actually, if you watch the game, he got a shot to the uh, nose early in the game and had to be taken out because his his nose was bleeding all over the place. They had to take him out. It took him a while to get him stopped. But once he got it stopped, he was actually playing part of the game with a a plug hanging out of his nose, uh, which eventually fell out and, uh, again, did not uh, stop him from putting on what a performance. So, again, you know, you go to New York, you know, a team like that, he gets hot. I could see them, although they're probably going to have to win four games. But, uh, you know, any one of these ten teams probably could get hot at the right time and uh, win this. Well, let's talk about the uh, first game, the game tomorrow night that uh, the Musketeers have to worry about, uh, at Butler. Been a while since we played Butler, and if you remember – That was the game. The Musketeers were down 10 points with four minutes left and came back to pull off a 70-69 to win at the Cintas. Uh, Bulldogs are on a little bit of a slide themselves. They've lost three in a row in four of their last five. What's important about Butler? How are the Musketeers going to win this one? Well, I think uh, going into Hinkle Fieldhouse, they're going to have to bring their best selves when it comes to decision-making. They cannot give Butler extra offensive possessions. They have to really limit those turnovers. Uh, you know, I think that's the one thing. If they do that, they will make it very difficult on Butler to um, win at home. Uh, they got to limit their looks. They can't let them get going. Get a you know put up extra three point shots because every extra one they get to put up is one more that could go in, and uh, you know that's their game. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Xavier, you know, last time they played, Xavier tried to make a concerted effort. I think to go inside, 
But I, I look back at that, and both bigs only scored nine points each. Um, and I, I think that Butler did a really good job of keeping the ball from being able to get into the paint. And, and part of that was that that led to Scruggs having a huge game for X mm-hmm. that day. I think he had uh, 23 points against him the last time. And that was a game we played without Quentin. Um, he was, um, I think that was the injured knee was still bugging him then. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so uh, the, uh, you know, that was also a game where Kyle Castlin had a huge game. Um, I think he had 12 points. He hit the big three pointer at the, uh, at the point where they were they were making that uh, surge at the end of the game, so I, you know I, I think they have to go in. They're gonna have to do the same thing, just kind of hold the the main four for Butler to their average, which is exactly what they did the, the last time they played. You know, uh, Kamar Baldwin he had he averaged 17.4, X held him to 18 in the last game, right at his average. Paul Jorgensen 11.4, he had 14. Jordan Tucker 9.8 a game, he had 12. Sean McDermott, 10 a game, he had eight. I mean, those are their big four guys. You, you just kind of keep them right around their average, and, and Xavier plays the way they're playing. Don't let anybody get going from three. And, uh, and I think X can go in there and pull off a big victory. Yeah, and, uh, you know, one concern I have is just Hinkle Fieldhouse. Again, uh, you've been there. The environment's kind of crazy. The crowd's kind of close. But, you know, I was concerned about that in playing at Carnesec Arena out in uh, Queens against uh, St. John's instead of uh, Madison Square Garden. And they seemed to not allow the crowd to really intimidate them. In fact, I think they kind of fed off of it a little bit. It kept them going. So that doesn't concern me. Uh, Yeah, I think the Musketeers have the advantage inside uh, over the uh, Bulldogs. Uh, I think they can dominate their big men. I don't think they'll score too much inside. Uh, I think they can get some points there. Uh, maybe, and uh, also they're going to have to, of course, guard the three-point line, but they have been doing a much better job of that. And, yeah, I think, uh, you know, a key for this team to really take off is for Paul Scruggs to hit his stride again. <clears throat> he uh, hasn't played poorly the last couple games, but just hasn't, uh, you know, if he can start knocking down some threes like he was uh, three weeks ago, uh, limit his turnovers a little bit, him and Najee still turning the ball over individually a little too much. If the two of them can, you know, find a, find an answer to that, I, I think the Musketeers, I think, have a great chance of winning this game. And I think they know they must win this game or it's going to put them really against the wall. They're going to have to go to New York to win the uh, tournament in order to uh, get a bid. Well, it's not a hard uh, hard out on the uh, Johnnies. We just saw him last <laughs> Thursday. Uh, one thing, uh, Mustafa Heron did play. He did not start, but he did play some and pretty effectively. So he will, it looks like, be back for that game. He did not play against the Musketeers out there. He had a uh, injured knee, and he'd been sidelined for a few games. Do you see the Johnnies trying anything different, or is it going to be the same game plan? you got to think, they might come at it a little bit differently. Yeah. You know, I, I think that the 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 defensive game plan from Xavier, you know, that obviously they're going to study whatever they did, but it, it, they you know, Xavier only they were going they were flipping back and forth from zone to man had them confused. I don't think that's going to work this time, especially though they they've never seen and I'm not sure we've seen X getting a one three one very much. Uh, usually when they go zone, it's 2-3, um, but they, they, they popped into the 1-3-1, one, one, and I think that, you know, they weren't expecting that. Uh, they'll be ready for that this time. Uh, you know, the thing is is that they're still going to have to handle those two post players for Xavier, uh, Tyreek and um, down low, and you know, figure out a way to to, de- to handle those guys. Um, you know, they they just didn't really have an answer for them. They tried using that uh, the freshman um, as a Josh Roberts. He Josh may Robinson. end up playing. Yeah, he may end up playing a little bit more. I mean, he wasn't 
completely ineffective, but even then, I mean, you're trying to ask a freshman to to check Tyreek, and that's just not fair um, to the freshman. Um, you know, and, and, and Tyreek uh, did a great job, and, and Zach was just his usual solid self. Um, you know, and, and when both of them were together, you, you, those moments when they were both on the floor, you could really just see St. John's was puzzled because they had a a six six guard trying to check Zach Hankins at you know four feet from the basket, and that's just not going to work. Um, and they really didn't get a whole lot against them on the other end. But part of the reason was Xavier didn't play that that lineup a whole lot. They they didn't stay with the two bigs on the floor together for a long stretch of time. I think the other benefit coming back this time is is Xavier will be back to full strength. They will not not have their suspended player missing. Um, and I think that, you know, Harden has given them a lot off the bench, and, and that will be uh, probably a difference maker these next two games as well, uh, having him so you, back in the lineup in the rotation. He will, be back, he will be back tomorrow? I have not that was what, Yeah, that was uh, – uh, I believe that was tweeted out by Shannon Russell – Earlier today, I saw that, but okay. I will double check. Well, I think the um, Musketeers have to uh, stay aggressive against them. In fact, uh, just uh, you said you didn't watch a game, but only the highlights. In that DePaul game, get this: five St. John's players fouled out. So obviously, they play defense with their hands a lot, and I think the Musketeers are going to just have to continue to be aggressive, and they're going to have to hit their free throws. And, again, hopefully, you know, 75%, uh, 80% would be nice. Uh, shooting 30-some free throws again, I think, would be maybe a key for victory as long as they can uh, knock them down. Yes, yes, I, I agree. And, uh, yeah, Elias Harden to return for Xavier against Butler. So he's he's back and back in, um, ready to well, return that's, to action. That's, that's good news because uh, another uh, key that I had on the Butler game, uh, and actually against St. John's too, is they both play a lot more players. Both of them go about nine deep. And uh, Musketeers, without Harden, were really only going seven deep. And at least we can go eight now. And, of course, Elias was getting uh, 20-some minutes there the last couple uh, games before that suspension. So hopefully he can uh, pick up where he left off, and hopefully the time off hasn't uh, – let any rust grow on him. So, well, it's going to be a, an exciting week of basketball, and it'll morph right into the Big East tournament that starts uh, March the 13th, which I believe is next Wednesday. I think that runs Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, if the Musketeers do happen to gain that third seat, I believe they would play their first game. Uh, 7 o'clock on Thursday, and I think if the way it looked, I think the uh, semifinals were TBA games. It's probably wherever the highest seed still is, and I would guess the Musketeers probably would play the second game. If they're the three seed, they would be probably playing the two seed in the semifinals. The one seed, unless they got upset, would be in the other side. And then I believe the finals is scheduled for about 6.30 Saturday night. And I believe all the games are on FS1 this year. Well, you ready for a little trivia, Bill? Go for it. Well, since the realignment, the Big East tournament has been played five times. Four of those five times, Villanova has been in the final game, and they have won three of the five, of course. So Villanova has won the Big East tournament in Madison Square Garden three out of the five times since the realignment of the Big East. Can you name the other two teams that won the tournament besides Villanova? Uh, I do believe that the Providence Flyers won one time. Since the realignment. Beat Creighton in twenty fourteen, you are correct. And the other non Villanova team was actually the team that beat Villanova in the finals. And I can tell you it wasn't Xavier because Xavier played him in twenty fifteen no. and lost in the finals. The yep. other team that beat him was twenty sixteen. Do you remember who that was? That's what I was trying to think of. Um twenty sixteen. I wanna say 
It was Seton Hall. Seton Hall is correct. In 2016, they beat Villanova uh, to win the Big East tournament and get the automatic bid. Well, we're hoping that the Musketeers, you know, it's been a while. I think we looked back a couple weeks ago. It's been maybe 2006. That's 13 years since the Musketeers have won a conference tournament. That, of course, would have been an A-10 tournament win. And they have yet to have a Big East tournament win, although they've made it to the finals in 2015. So, again, let's hope these Musketeers stay on that hot streak and can win these last two regular season games and uh, win the tournament. Any final thoughts about the Musketeers in this streak before we call it an evening? Hey, if we're going to have a, a, a streak of wins, we're going to have to keep a, a, another streak going for the Muskies, and hopefully he continues to play at the high level he's playing. You know, Najee Marshall again, uh, Big East honor roll. Uh, so that's just awesome for that young man to uh, continue to receive those honors and, and to play at the level he's playing at. And it's fun to watch. Very fun to watch. Well, we'll be back Next Monday night, we'll be talking about the last two regular season games, and then we'll be right on the brink of starting the Big East tournament, and we'll be talking about uh, all that, and we'll have maybe a clearer picture of what the Musketeers' postseason will look like. And, you know, again, it was awful dark a few weeks ago, but it looks like the Musketeers have a little light now and maybe can make it back to a little March Madness in the NCAA tournament. So with that, we'd like to thank Mike Goodpaster and the Grueling Truth Network for putting our podcast out there in a lot of different places where you can find it. And we thank all the fans for listening to us. And as we sign off, we say, go Muskies. Go Muskies.